So I'm a Proto. I work at Optimism. I am a research and developer, and um, we're building a layer two rollup. And to scale the rollup, we of course need to scale layer one. We need to fix the primary bottlenecks of Ethereum, and then after fixing those, we're hitting the next bottlenecks with increased execution. So, what does this talk about? This talk is about data availability. It's basically the what. What are we trying to fix? Then we have the roller-centric roadmap. This is the how. Like, how <laughs> is this going to work for Ethereum in the future? We have modular blockchains. It's a way to encapsulate complexity. We have the merge, the first part of this modularity. We have blobs and further scaling. And then I'll talk about the optimism upgrade. So what is data availability? You could think of this as the primary scaling bottleneck in Ethereum today, where if you have some layer one, it's kind of like doesn't use Ethereum quite right. It doesn't offer what the like layer two needs, right? So data availability is not about bandwidth or about storage or about processing. Like these are all properties that you can scale today using traditional Web2 technology. It's something you can scale on individual machines. But this is really like data availability is about the permissionless ability to reconstruct state. Reconstruction of state enables many different crypto economic scaling solutions. Right now you don't have to trust any particular party but instead you can reconstruct the state yourself and can challenge the system. So how does this challenging look like or how does this kind of execution check look like? If you combine this data availability property with some kind of proofing technology, you get a rollup. And so you have a ZK rollup or an optimistic rollup. The difference here is that the ZK rollup has an immediate validity proof, whereas in optimistic rollup it's a fault proof where you kind of have two flavors, a non-interactive and an interactive uh, flavor, where the non-interactive flavor kind of like is similar to the ZK rollup, except you only do it in the pessimistic case, right? Where you, in the worst case, if there's fa a fault, you can challenge the original proposer of the data, of the proposal, to show them that they're wrong. And so with some bonding, you can secure the system. In the interactive version, you have, to have the same, but you have multiple rounds of this game to show that the sequencer or the proposer is wrong. So there are two kinds of data availability. There's the type of data availability where everything is available forever. This is the kind of naive solution that we have today in Ethereum, that we have today in Bitcoin, that everyone knows. And then there's the data that's once available. Like this is a lesser data availability, but it's good enough for layer two. Because if you think about layer two, what you really need is the assumption that at least one honest actor can reproduce the state to challenge whoever is progressing the state. If you cannot join the system, you cannot basically become the new sequencer or win or try and like prove the existing system wrong. Reconstruction is important. But say if you had a month, some honest actor will be able to reconstruct the data and will be able to prove the system wrong when it fails. And so you can challenge or replace any bad sequencer with just the data once available assumption. And there are different arguments for, oh, should we make data available for maybe just 10 minutes, maybe just a week? And uh, right now we're staying with a conservative one month or maybe even longer. It's already a huge leap compared to the data forever available since um, we're now not paying the unbounded price for whatever it takes to store the data forever. Instead, we have a bounded limit on how much data for how long will be stored, and it can be cheaper this way. Okay, so let's talk about the rollup centric Ethereum roadmap. It's not a new idea. This is something that Vitalik already proposed in 2020, 
our way back before rollups and before plasma and before other skating technologies. There was already something called a shadow chain, which was a chain that was derived from another chain. And so a rollup works kind of the same, where you derive the rollup data from the layer one data. And this enables us to decouple the execution from the data, and we can dump down the layer one in favor of these more advanced layer two execution environments. And that way we can scale our execution independent of the layer one bottlenecks and independent of the layer one ossification. This is huge because it keeps Ethereum competitive with other chains. So how do we really achieve this kind of thing, right? Well, you need to encapsulate complexity. There's no denial that there's like a growing complexity in Ethereum. And the only real way to manage this is to try and encapsulate it. So this sparked the, like the new trend in blockchain design where now everything is modular. All the new layer ones, they're all modular, modular, modular. Because of the increased in complexity, you cannot keep going on this monolithic GAF fork. All the previous 2017 alt layer ones are just a copy of GAF in one way or another, adding new consensus or adding new things. But if you don't decouple the components, it will grow in complexity and it will be more and more difficult to maintain. Okay, so let's walk you through this modular design. So we start with layer one today. This is where things are very monolithic. We kind of just combine proof of work and the execution layer. There's one block. There's just one thing called ETH hash that secures everything. And it's just kind of singular. Now, think about the merge. We have this proof of stake beacon chain already live for a year now. We kind of want to couple that to our execution layer and get rid of proof of stake. And we do this with the engine API where the engine API couples the beacon nodes, the consensus layer, and the engine, which is the execution layer, makes them talk together, and then we can basically encapsulate these two different things. So then we'll start to look like this, small steps. It's like the first tiny thing of modularity in Ethereum, which we hope like comes sometime this summer, hopefully this year, where we now have two different layers. And we have proof of stake. Okay, so now if take a step back, I think about layer two. How are we really going to scale Ethereum, right? So this is the current design where we have deposits and the sequence data. You pull it, you process it, you push back the proposals and anything you need in the future to sync the layer two chain. This is still kind of monolithic. And now, think about Ethereum today. It's kind of silly also. Like, we use the execution layer to store data into. We take <laughs> one execution layer from layer two, and we use the data availability from layer one that's used for call data. This thing, this type of EVM inputs that you compete with for DeFi, that you, is really a huge ask. That's why the base fee is so high. There are too many parties that are interested in this data because it's the most naive, most simple solution. But we should really try and specialize. We can do better than this. So instead, we want a layer one data provider. We want a layer two to kind of just use the data from layer one and not touch the EVM at all, except in the case when there is a fault proof or some kind of validity proof to resolve the execution. Now, if you think about other layer ones right now that are trying to fix the data availability problem, they don't have a unified execution layer. They just have what we know as layer two. They just have an execution layer, some kind of software and rollup system where you can have these different rollups chained together, but notice how there are no fault proofs or no validity proofs in this diagram. This is because they happen off chain. They're not part of the layer one system. And then, um, well, we do have a data availability layer and we can scale the chain by a little bit, at least. Still, we can do better. And for Ethereum, we need to do better because we want to preserve this whole DeFi ecosystem. We are not throwing away everything that we have. Instead, we want to embrace data while keeping our beautiful global execution environment. 
So this is EIP 4844. This is the, the change that we're trying to introduce um, to introduce data without breaking Ethereum. It's a kind of a meme where we say it's like the full sharding design developed by Dankrat, working at the Ethereum Foundation. It's called Dank Sharding. And so I work on this EIP, um, and it's kind of like the, the precursor to the full design, so called proto Dank sharding. <laughs> okay. So how does proto dunk sharding look like, or how does EIP4844 look like? Think about it as our consensus layer, so this is after the merge. Then we have our execution layer, so this is including DeFi. And then we have a separate layer for these data blobs, which means that we can host our data for, say, a month for some limited amount of time. That's enough to secure the layer twos, while also providing more capacity. And notice how we're providing blobs in a very specific format. It's just not any format. This makes it forward compatible with the full design of Dank sharding. What we're trying to achieve here is that we don't have to make any modifications anymore to the execution layer to go Ethereum. Instead, we only in the future we work on the consensus layer to implement these more advanced technologies for full Dank sharding and scale even further. So let's talk about the full version. So, well, we add more of those blobs. That's the obvious uh, one. We introduce data availability sampling, which sounds really complicated, but it's really not. It's this technology where instead of having one blob or one collection of blobs per block that you have to enforce everyone to download and to keep available, instead you can distribute it through the network. You can split the task. And to secure, you just have any validator do these random checks, requests to others in the network to make sure the data is still there. And then there are fancy data extension and data recovery techniques to increase the chances to make it like really, really secure that those checks actually map to a data being available or not being available. And uh, like I said, it's forward compatible, so we can get away with a single layer upgrade again even though we're scaling by another 10 times. So how does this look like? Well, it kind of looks very similar, where except now we have many more blobs per EVM uh, block. And this means that we go from like around a megabyte on average per layer one block to 64 times that. So now we're talking about 1.4 megabytes, megabytes per second. Uh, whereas now we have like 70, 80 kilobytes per 14 seconds on layer one. It's a huge difference. It's like 100 times, <laughs> if not more, uh, in scaling. So, okay, let's talk about optimism bedrock. Optimism bedrock is this kind of philosophy where we want to take a layer two. We don't want a rushed version that tries to roll everything on their own, but then also not like really provide the users with what they want. What the users want is something very similar to layer one, but faster, but cheaper, and more usable. So we want to keep snap sync. We want to make sync of your node as fast as possible. We want to have a transaction pool. We don't have this centralized endpoint to submit transactions to. We want fast block propagation. We want the equivalent execution environment. You just want to run GAF, really. We want deposits that are actually nicely typed and not some hacked version on top of the current system. And we want to improve the stability on like how this layer two comes to exist and how it extends. So we want constant block time, cheaper transactions, and a bunch of other optimizations there. How are we going to achieve this? We have modularity. So think about layer one today, it's like GAF. Now we're adding Prism with the proof of stake chain. And we can do better. We can repeat this pattern on layer two, where now we have a consensus layer on layer two and an execution layer on layer two, which means we separate all the rollup technology from Go Ethereum. So Optimism is just a stateless client, really easy to set up. No database, no configuration, it's just there. And it pulls data from layer one, converts it, processes it, and forwards it to the layer two version of GAF. And so we get this 
the same pattern where the beacon node talks to layer one GAF, the OP node talks to layer two GAF. And you can repeat the pattern the other way around. We have the beacon chain talking with the beacon chain, layer one with the layer one, and so on. Everyone talks with their own kind. And here again, layer two kind of just does the same as the beacon chain, where it distributes blocks in a faster way. But notice how layer two is like the happy case, and layer one is the base case. Layer one always guarantees security. If the layer two completely fails and falls apart, you can still reconstruct it from the layer one. So it's always there. I was live in a way where you can process deposits, you can keep keep continuing. But we also repeat like the EVM, the sync, the transaction pool, we keep all these properties. And so it will feel and look a lot like layer one. And the one difference that we want users to take away here is that they don't have to change their systems, they don't have to change their DeFi projects. It's just going to get more and more, like it's going to get better for them, less expensive. So this is what it looks like if the data provider and the engine kind of just have now one way to pull the data from, one way to pull these deposits and our execution activity from. Rollup node sits in between, maps everything to layer two, and then layer two is this engine which processes the, uh, the blocks. And um, well, it's all open source. We don't hide new upgrades from the world. We, we are here to share everything. We are here to get feedback from you, F, you. And you can go to this repository. We're planning to merge it with the other Optimism Mono repo. Right now it's a separate specification repo. We have a reference implementation and a local DevNet as well. So you can get started. It's all very experimental with our specifications. You can learn about all of this. And uh, it's uh, what we think is the future of modular blockchain and Ethereum scaling. Thank you. <laughs> we have some time for questions? Yeah, if we have any questions, uh, we can bring the mic around to you. Come on, we gotta have some questions. I can go back got, to the diagrams. Yeah. I got there, you. There's a lot more to them. <laughs> so from what I'm getting, uh, Ethereum is not going to need a separate data availability layer to just support instant data availability, a separate layer like Celestia or something like that. So sorry, to repeat the question, you're asking about the differences between like a data focused layer one and Ethereum, right? Yes. Okay, so and you mentioned Celestia as an example. So Celestia is one of those cases where software rollups be, are becoming the new thing. Whereas I think like we don't want to shy away from like this unified execution layer. It has a lot of value for different purposes. I think one of the main cases here in terms of security is that we can play these validity proofs and these execution things on chain, which sounds slow, but it's only in the worst case. And so we get better guarantees for the completion of this security game. And when you think of a software rollup, it all has, has to happen off chain. And so once somebody starts to publish these things and they cannot publish it in time, and, or when they reveal themselves, they're more vulnerable to be like, try to be censored, try to be attacked, some kind of denial of service attack. Whereas if you have layer one to publish to, you publish the layer one, you have a week of time to, to do so in the optimistic case. And then once it's confirmed, nobody doesn't see default proof. There's no hiding of the uh, execution. Whereas with Celestia, it's really focused to try and be purely data and they're doing everything outside of layer one. Also, I think another case is bridging where if you think of all these different layer twos, if you have like a really diverse system, you want to bridge liquidity, you want to do so with the utmost security. You don't want to rely on centralized bridges. We all know <laughs> how that goes. Like just yesterday or like the day before, there was a $600 million hack on one of these bridge platforms. Like really you should have a roll-up type of bridge with like the security guarantees of a system instead of 
any random actor that operates the bridge. Yeah, if anyone wants a good job, they should be uh, looking into kind of monitoring that stuff too. Like you could probably, um, you could probably find a, a good job for right. monitoring to make sure that kind of stuff doesn't happen because I don't think that they had any monitoring in place. Monitoring or auditing of bridge systems is probably the most lucrative business right now, yes. All right, we have one more over here. Hello, thanks for the presentation. So if a relayer posts a fraudulent um, bundle and fraud proof happens and it is detected that it is fraud, what's the current economic cost in Optimism now? Right, so I think the current rollups, none of them have running fault proofs yet. I mean, there's a huge reputational cost. They do enable like default proofs in the future. I think, so Optimism doesn't have default proofs enabled right now. Arbitrum has like a, what is it called? Like a uh, allow list to only have like a selective accounts do this fault proof. And then some of the ZK systems are not in production either yet. So in, in a way, I think we're not quite there yet in the roll-up centric Ethereum. I do hope to get there in the future. But once we get there, we're we talking about millions, billions. Sorry, can you speak up and repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. So once this is in place, uh, I, I, if I understand, the relayer will have to put a bond and if anyone wants to meet the fraud proofs, it, this bond has to be matched. So right. I'm wondering what would so, be the size right. of these so bonds? If you do execute the fault proof, what would happen is that the proposer is independent of the layer one, layer two. So the proposer, you have to really have to think of it as a way to bridge back activity from layer two, some kind of messaging like withdrawals to the layer one. And like in this case of Celestia or these other data centric layer ones, you don't need these proposals if you don't have a way to, if you don't, if there's nothing to bridge back to. Like the fault proof is really just about showing layer two activity to layer one and the layer two will not be affected by the fault proof at all. Everyone on the layer two will interpret the data their way, will process it their way, just like if somebody pr processes a fake proof of work or does some fake voting of proof of stake, it doesn't change the system or the rules of the execution. Everyone processes their own chain. And it's really just the layer one that you're, con you're trying to trick with like a bad proposal. And it just purely depends on the bonding of the proposer on how much they get slashed. And we can parameterize this, we can have like a huge bond to secure this type of withdrawal. Okay, thank you. All right, we still have about two minutes. If anyone else has any questions, just raise your hand. If you have questions about the modularity between Sorry. the data and the execution layer, and then specifically about execution, you should maybe wait for the talk from Ansgar, who is going deeper into that type of scaling. Hello, hi. Uh, I have a question about the uh, latency about the data blocks. Uh, if we say one of the data uh, blob in one uh, shard, and then uh, how long time it takes to uh, synchronize this blob across the entire network? The current EIP describes the usage of uh, the current transaction pool, so we're not changing propagation. And so it'll just be like a regular transaction where it just depends, do you pay enough of a base fee? And if yes, then your blob transaction with all the data will get confirmed. Okay, and the uh, side question about this is about, uh, uh, you mentioned the data rate to save a blob in the blockchain is about 1.4 megabytes per second. So I would like to mo know more about the bottleneck about the data rate. Is that the synchronization issue across the network? All right, so we do plan to scale the data by a lot, and this of course raises network concerns. How much data can you propagate? Does it scale? It's definitely something we want to test. It's not something you can work out neatly in theory, where we have both on the exclusion layer as well as on the consensus layer, this increased network activity. And so in the upcoming DevNets, we'll try and benchmark that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, round of applause, please. Proto Lambda.